the nicest site you've been doing, all the sort of sites that can tell quite a nice story. So um, I'll talk through them, and it's. Can you use the mic, please? Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll talk through them, and it's basically we're going to um, look at the archaeology almost in chronological order. So, some of the earliest period of the Neolithic right up, and then to the um, sort of medieval period. Is that working? So, this first slide is, um, as you can see, there's me, there's Roddy in the middle, and then there's Hilary on the far side with her hand axe that we've got from my owner. Body looking a bit less clean from the piece of pottery, and now I've got a rather nice stone tool in the hand there. So that was, um, it was fairly new to archaeology. And she turned around to me and she said, Oh, was this anything there? And I went, Oh, yes, a Neolithic hand axe. Well, I don't know. It's open here. So the first site we're going to look at is on Iona. Um, the actual site we're talking about today is the artist's residence, which is here. Um, but we'll also the same sort of deposit I'm talking about today is um, I've also found it in a rural cottage, at the primary school, the village hall, um, Derrick Beer, and um, also a block house. So these sites um, I've worked on in the village on my own land because this material also occurs there. Um, this is the nunnery, so the nunnery wall formed the boundary of our, our site. And you can see um, what we're interested in the site here is this deposit 003, which turns into um, 057 down here. But it basically covered this whole area and was underneath these deposits here. So the nunnery is about um, 12th, 13th century, and some of the medieval material we have, these post holes, there's a half down there, I'm not really sure in any detail. And the deposit we're looking at lies underneath this. And this deposit, this is a picture of it here. It's basically an enriched um, soil. It's enriched with mid material. And you can see it in this slide. So all this black material you can see here occurs under this paler brown material. Um, and this is the basically what it is is a soil that people have thrown their waste into it over the years. Um, and we were getting quite a good. Um, materials, um, artefacts from this. This line here is because they were digging um, a deeper area to the house, the, the building, but also that marks 10 metre contour line on Iona, and that in the period that we're talking about, which is the Neolithic, which is about um, five, five and a half thousand years ago, was the old um, seashores, so the old sea cliff. Because in the Neolithic period, it was after the Ice Age, and Scotland had been squashed down by the weight of the ice, and it hadn't rebounded yet, so the sea level was much higher, about 10 metres, in about um, 10 metres higher than it is today. So at this period, these guys were basically dumping their household waste and domestic refuge on the edge of the seashore. So this next slide, so this is the um, hand axe that Hillary was demonstrating earlier on. It's made probably from a pebble that they found on the shore in Iona. So it's not a particularly well known geology for hand axes. But you can see it's a beautiful polished stone near the hand axe. Um, so we're looking at about, for the date of this, we're looking at about 3,500, 3,400 BC. So a good five, five and a half thousand years ago. Um, this one, hand axe, it looks less impressive, and you can see it's being used, but this is actually porcelain line, and this material, there's a um, axe factory in Northern Ireland, in County Antrim, where this material was um, extracted and made into rough, well, possibly finished hand axes and rough house, and this material was traded throughout Britain. So it shows that the folk on living on Iona, they, they were actually <coughs> in connect, in um, connected to, either directly or indirectly, to folk in Northern Ireland and they were trading and exchanging materials including sort of exotic, exotic wares like these handbags. <coughs> so we also got some really nice pottery from this site. So this is um, stab wear, this is probably the end of a feather that someone's used to decorate this pottery. What you've got to keep in mind for yourself is this piece of pot, this decoration is five and a half thousand years old. 
And we've got um, what we call the sides there, so it's got linear grooves on it, and then it's got stab decoration on the top, and that's the rim that, of a pot. Then we've got, um, we'll see this sort of pot again later on another side, but this is again in size lines with stab wear, and this is the, um, what we call the shoulder of the bowl, the carnation of a, a bowl, so it would have had a nice curve on it, the bowl. And we're also getting, in this midden material, later pottery as well, bronze age pottery. So this is a really nice beaker um, pot. So what we have on Iona, and why it's significant, is it's basically evidence of domestic, everyday life on Iona by people in the Neolithic period. And this is really quite a rare find because in Argyle, we don't really have evidence of domestic. Clearly people were living there because you've got all these amazing ritual monuments. You know, we've got hinges, you've got standing stones, you've got very cairns. We don't really have the evidence of the domestic um, occupation. So we're starting to get it here on Iona. And that soil that they, they were developing was used in the Bronze Age also to, in which they dumped their rubbish. And elsewhere, so for example, the primary school site, I got the same soil that had obviously been planned <coughs> and got Bronze Age like, um, date for it from, from the soil, from structures within the soil. So they had, we had our marks up in the primary school. So this soil was being used in the Neolithic and continued to be cultivated and farmed into the Bronze Age. So Iona normally is associated with St. Columba of the, you know, the early Christian, the early medieval period. But it's got a much, much longer history. So we now move on to the site um, we excavated at Benesson, which is on the Rotten Mole, so not that far um, from Iona. Um, so this is Benesson, our site is in here, and again this is a single house pot development. Um, and you imagine the sea, again we've been about 10 metres higher, so the sea was actually encroached up into this um, little um, river valley here. So the site would be quite, again, overlooking the sea. And what we have here is actually a mid middle Neolithic structure, dating back 3200 to about 3000 BC. Structures in the Neolithic um, in Scotland are really, really rare. You get these big monumental timber halls, um, but most of them are all in the east, really, um, in Aberdeenshire and Angus and further <coughs> down, but on that east coast. Um, and they're usually a bit early, but it's sort of early Neolithic. We've got hardly a handful of Neolithic, middle Neolithic structures in Scotland. There were none until sort of this one in Argyll at all. So this is a really quite significant and exciting find. Um, and the way it's structured is that this round here is um, a shallow ditch or a bedding trench, and within that would be some kind of organic walling, so probably timber, either planks, certainly in Ireland where they get loads of um, middle Neolithic um, and early Neolithic structures. The walls are made timber planks set in the bedding trench, and they have had some sort of, kind of organic roofing. So we've got that coming here. Unfortunately, this side's been totally plowed away, cultivated away on this side. Um, and then this picture in the middle is a probably the remains of where a tree was. But again, it's quite ancient, and folk in the Neolithic were quite into their ritual. And they didn't really separate ritual from everyday life either. So it could be that they've actually centered their house on a specific tree that for some reason had some meaning for the, for the people here. So just to explain this, you've got the bedding trench here, so that's a ring of walling um, around the house. Possibly there's two post doors here, so this may have been the entrance. And then you've got um, couple of post holes here. So this is the earliest phase. The red, or the red in there is the notes where we found pottery. And then this is a slightly later phase um, where these posts are basically being backfilled and we've got a hearth in here and then lots of ash around. So there's <coughs> two phases to this one structure so it was remodelled at some point in its life. And this is just a sort of a view from a, a pole camera. So you can see that's the hearth, and this is the, the bedding trench coming around here. And you can see the cut the post holes here. So this is as we excavated, just sort of like see this is how we find the pottery. So you can see this is basically a dump of ash and broken pottery. It's like mineral material. It's either been deliberately placed 
um, into or next to this trench or just stood on the floor and they just left it there and been trampled in. When you clean it up, you start bringing it back together. This is the sort of pottery we're getting in the middle of the Neolithic period. So they're huge, quite big, substantial um, vessels. And this is called a lug, which is a little handle um, that they would have used um, to uh, carry this vessel around him. Um, just going to have a look at this area here. Now, I think what happened is these guys were digging their, their trench. And you can see the big stone here. And with this big stone, they've obviously dug down through the soil, found this big stone, and you can see they've actually diverged around it. They couldn't take it out. I think what's happened in this area here, they've probably hit another big stone, and they've actually pulled that stone out. But they've created a void which has ruined their line and the edge of their trench for their flanks or the edge of their house. So, to overcome that, what these guys did, rather than just filling it with soil, because they do, there's a lot of strange stuff goes on in the Olympic in terms of depositing pottery and bits of artifacts in the Olympic pit. What these guys have done, they've gone along, they've got those big holes, they've used pottery, and they've just layer on layer on layer on layer of pottery they've used to build up, to fill up that hole, to create basically the line <coughs> and the they wanted. And then within that, we're getting almost complete vessels. And you can see these are called round base vessels. Um, so they would have just sort of roughed them in, nestled them into the fire, and used them as cooking vessels or water vessels. Um, and you can see this has got this nice and sized decoration up here, very, very similar to the stuff we were getting on, um, on Iona. And then this is, um, this is a detached love associated with this vessel. And um, this is how it illustrated really for publication. And you can see this one's also associated, um, another one's associated with um, a little perforation through the top of near the rim. So presumably some of these vessels would have hung up maybe over the fire as well. Now what's interesting is that this pottery here is probably 200 years earlier than the date of when this structure was being used. And what I think is probably happened, and again, this has kind of been shown in other, other work that's been going on, we've got this at Glen Stella. Basically, ancestral, ancestor was very important to these people um, and linked to the past. And we think what's happening here is they may be keeping and um, having these pots as part of their sort of family history. And when they built this new house, they've actually used their old pots that they've kept from generations and generations, and they've put them in, and they've backfilled them in to the new house. Um, so the radio part of the date we're getting from there is a couple of hundred years earlier than the actual dates we're getting for the, for the house itself. And this is a bit of a close-up of that perforated piece of pottery there, and you can see another one there. Um, and then, this is love more. We've got, as my owner and, and from um, Vanessa, we've got tons of really nice pottery. And again, this is a really nice sort of connection of the past. You can see these little grooves of this pottery, and here and here, these <coughs> fingernail marks. So these are like 5,000 year old fingernails that somebody, when they were making that pot, that's how they decorated it using their fingernails. So it's a really nice connection to the, to the past. And you can see group wear, um, stab wear, um, slightly sort of raised up um, patterns. So, um, Alison Sheridan, Dr. Alison Sheridan, she's been doing all the posh analysis with me, and basically a lot of this um, pottery is unique to our garden in a way, but it has reference to other styles that are, that are more commonly known, especially in the east of Scotland. You know? A lot more developments happened in the East of Scotland, so we know a lot more about the Neolithic in the East of Scotland. So there's this shared sort of style, but Alvaro's got its own specific style of pottery. So then we're going to have a um, go to Upper Largy now, which is Martin Glen, so <coughs> slightly nearer um, to my home anyway, at least. Um, and Kilmartin, as you all know, is known as a ritual centre for prehistoric um, archaeology. So it's got the Neolithic stuff, and then it's got the Bronze Age cairns, um, it's got temple wood, 
um, huge amounts of archaeology in uh, Kilmarnock then. So I've been working on the quarry for quite a number of years now. Um, and this was down near the sort of entrance of the quarry in the field um, to the west of the main quarry. And you can see we've got this deposit here. And this is, um, survived in a hollow. And basically, it's very like Iona, it's a, it's a midden and rich soil. Um, so when we excavated it, we got all this beautiful pottery. And this is called group work. So it's slightly later in, later in day again, so 2800, 2600 BC. Group work, the style, is thought to originate in Albany, but it, it, it moved rapidly, the style moved rapidly down through and was adopted throughout Scotland. So the dates we're getting for our group work here are actually sort of contemporary with when group work was being used in Albany. So again, this is always amazes me that in this period, people had these connections, either directly or indirectly, with people, you know, in our dial from Orkney. And obviously, people weren't generally travelling by land then, they were travelling by boat. We don't have any of those boats, we don't know what they look like. But it would be much easier in the past to travel by sea than by land. And obviously there was this great connection between people in different communities throughout Scotland. So this is... Um, this is grooved ware. Um, so again, another nice first for us really. It's the largest grooved ware assemblage ever found in, in Argyle. And it's the first grooved ware that's actually been found in Kermark Glen. Um, Alison and I differ now on our interpretation because she thinks that deposit of midden and rich soil is the result of feasting. Um, it's got a little bit of um, flint and <coughs> worked flint in it. It's got a few stone tools, not a lot. Um, my interpretation of it and the interpretation of the Vithix people, the Flint people, and the, the Cornerstone people is it's typically domestic. Alison wants it to be a result of ritual feasting. How we can tell the difference? Because when you eat something ritually or eating it just to keep yourself fed, how do you tell the difference? Like, as our chemistry, you don't. We don't have any structures associated with this, this deposit, so Alison suggesting because we don't have that, it must be ritual. But as I've already said, there's a handful of non domestic structures from the Neolithic in Scotland anyway. So it's not surprising we haven't got them. So we're, we're, we're um, agreeing to disagree at the moment on the interpretation. Personally, I think it's because it's in Kilmartin Glen, it doesn't make it richer. Um, we have one feature from the main quarry excavation um, that's essential to date is this it's a pick that's possibly associated with even later um, burial. So it's not contemporary with any of it, it's not a contemporary with the cursus, for example, that we dug at Quarry earlier on, and it's not contemporary with the tin circle there, because that's much later, the Bronze Age. So, yeah, jurors out in the interpretation of what this, this eating actually meant, whether it was ritual or domestic. Um, again, <laughs> I had to have a bit of a laugh at this when, because Fraser, National Museum of Scotland, is doing all my post excavation for me. Um, so, we're hopefully going to publish this in the next few months. Um, he emailed me really excited and said, Did we hear the screams from Edinburgh? And I'm like, No, what are you talking about? And these stones here. And if you can see the groove marks on them, the little scratch marks, they are interpreting at the National Museum of Scotland that these are Neolithic um, portable art. So they're interpreting these groove marks. You can see here there's like a rec sort of rectangular mark and then scratch marks. And the same on this. Um, as glossy shaped um, designs um, engraving on this stone. And they're relating them to this is the Baron Kiss, which is just near Loch Gilpet. With this, the, the argument is that this stone was reused in the Bronze Age, but it's actually Neolithic in origin. You can see the lozenges on here. And if I go back one slide, there's lozenges lozenge shaped on this pottery here. <coughs> so, they're in that of Scotland, they're interpreting these two slate, um, this as portable Neolithic art. Again, that would be first for Argyle. I'm a bit sceptical, but you know, I'm not the expert, so I've, I've got to go with it. And that's what they're telling me they are, and they're really, really excited by it. So I thought I'd share that with you. Then the last thing, again, I think this is just a really nice kind of 
piece that shows the sort of humanity of these folk. Um, this is actually, you can see the impression in here. It's actually where they've made uh, a pot and they've made it within a, a woven basket. And they put the clay in the basket to sh give the shape to the pot. So that's the impression of the basket. So again, I just think that's just a nice, a nice little piece there. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go now. We're gonna leave, leave the Neolithic, we're going to the Late Bronze Age. So this is Ardnaho, which is on Isla. And you can see, it's typical Argyle weather, rather wet. This is our site here. This is Ardnaho Distillery, so it's a sort of fairly new distillery. And they're gonna put in um, all their wanted warehouses in here. So we did an evaluation and we found the ground cat. So we were there, oh, I think it was over Christmas time, it was dreadful weather anyway. I remember it being incredibly cold and wet. Um, <laughs> but what we got, we got um, a late Bronze Age ground cat, so about 900 BC. So on the drawing here, the black circles, they're the posts. So they would have gone, timber up, right, sort of gone up, and then there'd be timber around the circle of posts, and then the roof would have been supported on the beam, supported on that ring of timbers. <coughs> Um, we have this browning material, I show orange and brown material here. This is actually um, stone and turf wall that had been burnt in situ. So this round house had some dreadful accident, basically burnt down in situ. And very rarely the timber, um, the turf front, the turf and stone wall, uh, wall, which is clearly in between the posts, have basically survived on this side of the site. So again, that's the first time I've ever seen that, so that was a really nice find. Um, we've got a central hearth, we've also got a hearth outside. You've got internal posts in here in blue that have been making little um, divisions for rooms and also around the fire. Obviously, they were having posts that, you know, they could then hang things over the fire from that post. I think this is um, um, a turf wall that came around, it probably came around the whole site at one point. Um, here was a, like a cobbled yard, and then this sort of um, teardrop shaped pit in here was basically a rubbish pit, and it was absolutely jammed full of pottery. <coughs> so that was really, you know, got tons and tons of pottery from there. Just in this pit in here, we have actually a pot that had been buried in a, in a pit for some reason. Um, and then we have another sort of structure out with that. A sort of sub rectangular kind of structure, but again, it also by the post so we don't really know that was for what that was for. And then over here in one corner, we had cloud marks, which are probably contemporary with this round house. So basically, we've got a, a, a domestic settlement here from the late Bronze Age, and clearly they're cultivating the land at that point. So, this is an area shot of it. Um, you can see that these are our Timber posts coming around that support the structure, and this is this is this burnt down wall in here, and then this is actually a drain that went underneath. And as that first shot showed you, the the water came off the hill and would have hit that roundhouse, and presumably it was doing this in the late Bronze Age. So they've actually built a drain from one side of that roundhouse that went underneath and out through the other side. They obviously, capture the water on the edge of the roundhouse and, and feed it under their their house. Um, so it's quite an interesting little feature. This is that pot being excavated that was actually still in the ground. You can see at the top here, it's been truncated probably by our machine when we were clearing off the top, so we're also ploughing. Um, and this is Kerry who came to volunteer, and you can see what awful weather it was, but she looked happy. She's found a pot, and you can see the black inside. That's um, the residue, so the pot was on the fire, and obviously got it too hot and it's blown up this inside. So we're getting that analysed, that material inside, so we'll be able to tell what they were cooking. What was burned onto that pot. So that's Ardenhoe, fantastic little um, late Bronze Age roundhouse. So now we're going to move into the Iron Age, so we're whizzing through time. Um, this is back to Upper Largy. Dramatic Glen has often been described as a ritual landscape. Probably was in certain periods, but we're getting more and more evidence that there was actually also a lot of domestic occupation. So uh, up along now, you can see here we've got, down here we've got a lot of archaeology. This is basically two round houses, one on top of the other. We've got two round houses down here, one on top of the other. We've got this nice sort of post hole palisade. In this area we have an area of metalworking. And then in the central area we have two or three features, but one of which 
I'm calling a vast shape to structure, which I'll talk about later. But it's something that um, I've certainly never seen before, and I can't find any any sort of parallels to it. And then you can see these huge pits. These were basically um, pits that the Iron Age folk used to extract the gravel, and then they made some really nice cobble yards, which we'll, I'll show you photographs of that in a minute. So we're just going to talk about concentrate on the Iron Age archaeology in this area here. So this is the plan of the site, so it's actually flipped from the photograph we showed. So this is at the, um, uh, the north end of the site, and you can see um, the earliest ground house is shown in orange. You've got the post cross coming around, you've got a porch area here. So presumably the wall would really come right around here. And you can see this orange feature here, this Vivian Gully. That's probably a drip gully. Um, so the water would have run off the roof, and again, to catch it, it's not going back into the roundhouse, it would have been channeled around the sides um, of the roundhouse. And then on the top of that, we've got the uh, slightly later roundhouse in yellow, and that's associated with this sort of stone wall. That actually wasn't the wall of the roundhouse as such, it must have been some sort of, I don't know if it's a wind break or enclosure, because it's not actually sitting um, <coughs> around in a sort of um, equal circle around around the post hole, so it's all centre. So I don't think it was part of the roundhouse, but it's clearly associated with it. And then there was a, a, a gravel um, cobbled yard outside. And then you've got the same thing that happened down here. So you've got the sort of pinky post holes um, being the earlier roundhouse, and then the blue ones being the later roundhouse associated with yet another another um, stone wall. <coughs> So this is the, the top one, this is uh, as it's being excavated, so this is the wall coming round, and this is the extra round house in here. And there's another one, so we've, we've gone down quite a bit further now, and we're getting the half, central half in here. We've got two or three halves or something there with these two round houses. Um, and you can see the, the post holes and things all coming up quite nicely. So this is the um, southernmost round house. So this is the wall. This is the later phase. And you can see this amazing cobble surface. This is under the soil. And they just take the bubble and they compacted it in. And we were basically working on or walking on the original Iron Age surface that these guys would have been walking on. And you can see here, in this picture here, that's actually a saddle from an earlier probably Bronze Age um, Time. So in the Iron Age, they had rotary coins, so you would have a, um, maybe a stick or something, and you'd have two pieces of stone, one on top of each other, and you'd call them go down the middle, and you'd turn your um, stone in and go on the core. Before rotary coins were invented, they had saddle coins, which were like this shape of stones, you had big stone on top, and you grind your core <coughs> using that. So they found this, and they used it as part of their flooring for their, for their own house. But it also hints, um, dare I say it, that there's domestic um, Bronze Age activity and or the <coughs> Neolithic happening in the Martin Glen at this period, but they're getting a saddle for them. So this is the um, bar shaped structure. Um, you can see it says double post hole here, so each of these post holes you can see here, this one actually had three posts in it, so there'd be three timber uprights, um, and here this is probably the entrance, there's one there, one there, one there, one there, and then they come round, round here, and back round, so it's like a upside down vase. These are massive, they're massive, massive, I mean probably from the wall to about here size, a huge big thing, massive post, going right round. Um, I thought it would come back near the thick old like Bronze Age. I thought it was some ritual monumental structure. Iron Age. Um, don't know what it was used for. Never seen one before. You get things called banjo enclosures down south, but they're huge compared to this. So it's a bit of a, it's a first, really. So we're going to have to do some more analysis on it and try and work out what it was used for. The only problem is only this one post will have any chalk or any material from it. It's all very typical Iron Age sort of seats and stuff. Um, all the other post holes were totally clean, so the post obviously rotted in situ. And you can see all the patterns survived, so these posts, they were just left and just rotted. 
So it's a bit of a mystery. And then we've got a later um, enclosure, a little sort of probably stock enclosure on top, and then even later material on top of that, which I won't talk about today. So we mentioned saddle and rotary quirns. So this is a saddle quern, these two pieces fit together. They've been deliberately broken and used as packing in the Iron Age roundhouse, but clearly date from an earlier period. Um, and then we've got lots and lots of rotary quirns on the site. Um, most of which are broken, most of which have been used to the extent that they won't be usable and then they've been used as packing and, and warden. However, there is one quern that um, had never been used but was deliberately broken. So again, even in the Iron Age, we're getting some sort of ritual associated with um, use of quirns and things. So up at Largy, the other really interesting um, discovery was in this area here. This is basically um, all these pale blues are post holes or little state holes. And this was an area where we've got a huge amount of evidence for metalworking. So we're getting um, moulds, so little bits of um, pottery like material that were made um, to take. Um, metal to either make um, knives or axes and that kind of thing. So we're getting little fragments of these moulds of metal already. Right? We're getting little bits of crucibles um, and that kind of thing in this area. And what we got, this is what it looked like if we started excavating it. So that's a feature in there, believe it or not. Um, and then this is it, excavated. So you can see this is all ashy material at the top here. It's a confusing feature because it actually um, there's a post hole as well, so it actually partly um, used a pre-existing post hole. But basically this is a metalworking furnace. So they're really tiny, really small, and above the ground you'd have um, clay, like a um, cylinder of clay, and that would be stuffed full of your ore and charcoal and things. And at the bottom you'd have some bellows and your fire, and you'd just keep it really, really hot and create this really, really hot um, environment in there. And at the bottom would come, or you slam, and then you collect at the bottom of your furniture, you know, your, your iron ore. And that's what this is here. What's nice about this, so is this is Iron Age, um, quite early, and again, it's another first for our girl. In our world, there's not one being found in situ associated with the settlement. So again, it's really quite an important find um, for a girl. <clears throat> and interestingly, the, in the phase before, this pit in here, um, so Marianne and the excavating in here got lots and lots of pieces of mould and crucible from it. And that's only 10 metres away from this furnace. So this appears to be the pit in which they were throwing all the waste for metalworking and they were just chucking all that. So the crucibles were little, and um, I'll show you the crucibles later on actually when we keep this one, but little pots that you melt, melt your uh, metals in, metal down in to then make your iron objects. Um, so there's obviously a massive amount of metal working and making of objects going on on this site um, at Upper Lowry. Right. Okay, so now we're going to move into the early Christian period. <coughs> so this is an excavation we've been doing for quite a few years now, but the last two or three, two or three phases, we've um, been looking at the monastery, um, St. Luke's Monastery, who whoops, was a contemporary of St. Columba. Um, so this is the, the church, parish church, which used to be the so Algar's first cathedral. Um, and we've already carbon dated some of the water there to the um, early to mid 13th century. And the name used to carry on up in this way. So that's where we first started, when I first got involved with the project, we were excavating the nave um, at the end of the parish church to find its angle and see what was there. There was an idea that it was a tower, so we found the tower, so it obviously had a, a tower at the end. Um, and when then, just through discussion, mostly with um, Robert Hay, um, thinking about, well, this is meant to be the site of a monastery, so then we decided, well, why don't we have a little investigation and see if we can find it. So this is some of our trenches from the very last phase, um, you can see here. And this is the, the new mount, which actually, tragically, 
as it was. This was built in the 1980s. And there's photographs of the builders just finding loads of human remains and just, well, for the moment, just throwing them away. And there's no archaeology done at all. But that gave us a clue as to, you know, it's, it's worth having an investigate in this field to see what was going on. So we asked the 
Radio Carl dated one of these red ones here. It came back, 7th century AD. So it's lovely and early, early Christian. Brilliant, fantastic. Couldn't, couldn't wish for a better day. And then this one, where we're here, is on a slightly different orientation. It's late, it's 10th century. But basically, it's a really early cemetery. So it was just like, oh, it just couldn't get better than that, really. And then, this is a wall. On this side of the wall, there are no burials. So this wall is contemporary with burials. It's basically enclosing the cemetery. And really, at this period, 7th century, you only get enclosed cemeteries if they're associated with a church. And the church, generally on the west coast, would mean a monastery. So even at this, in our first day, we were really, really excited because basically, yeah, I think we, you know, we've got really good evidence that we've got a monastery here. So the second place we went back, we dug around the sanctuary stone, and that was actually in high sort of state. Because what happened, this is probably my, got a bit of green glazed pot from the bottom of the, the cup of the stone, so I think it was moved in probably the 16th, 17th century. And what had happened all around here was huge amounts of infant and child burials. And if a child was born before it had been baptised or out of wedlock and things, then at that period children weren't allowed to be buried in consecrated ground. So I think what's happening is that people were then coming secretly at night, and there's some actually now found some um, documentary evidence of that this was happening, and people were then burying their children next to the sanctuary stone as a, a way of giving them, um, you know, a, a, in their eyes, you know, Christian burials they were allowed to do at that time. <coughs> So that really, I mean, it was, it was, it was quite difficult, you know, emotionally to dig it, because there's lots of little babies, um, you know, it's heartbreaking, you get, get like right here, you have two, two babies, one on top of each other, and here you've got two little kids on top of each other, maybe related, and maybe there was a disease, you don't know. But that slowed us right down, so we didn't really achieve our aim as much as we wanted to get down to the early burials in this area. But you can see we've got two, I'll show you these in a bit more detail, two, um, so probably early teenage burials here, and then quite an intriguing cluster of bones at this end. And then down here, as I said before, in the other, in the other um, trench, the same thing was happening, so then we're getting probably 12th, 13th century settlement down here, so we're getting some hot, probably metalworking hearth of fire in here, um, getting a hearth in here, so Cemetery had probably at this location probably gone out of use probably by the 11th, 12th century, and people then living on top of it or working on top of it. <laughs> so these are these two parallel burials we've got, possibly the Navy Brothers, two males anyway, um, and then we've got this cluster of bones up here. Now what we what we're doing is we send some of the bones off. This is a specific bone that I can't remember it's called behind the ear. You send off the DNA analysis and there's a there's a project called a thousand genome. It's done it's happening in Britain, so we sent the bones off to that. I think it's gonna to be too late. I was hoping they'd be seventh century. Because they can do DNA analysis and they can do a thing called isotope analysis on the teeth. So basically they can tell the genetics of these people. Um, and then link them, hopefully, I was hoping, ideally, you know, show that they were actually Irish monks coming over from Ireland and setting up in this one. I don't know if we're going to get that, but we'll see. wait and see. We haven't got these dated yet. But you can also then tell what they ate as well through an analyzing um, the teeth, whether they had mostly a terrestrial diet or a, or a marine diet. So that's the work that's ongoing at the moment, so we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, this pile of bones, you can see it's under a stone. Um, some of the bone in this is, is, is a bit odd. Some of it's articulated, which means that some of the ribs and the head of a person were all joined up and they're still there. But some of these other bones didn't belong to that person, but they've been piled into a grave. It, analysis is ongoing, so we'll work it out a bit more, but it's a bit of an odd, odd thing. So, um, while we were still there watching the boat, saw this mark on one of the leg bones from that pile of bones. And you think, oh, that's a bit odd. And that, that's another bone we've got, and you can see these marks here and here. And then a bit closer in, you can see. And then more here. Basically, this person was probably standing up and was having their leg hacked 
cap by a sword. Um, and presumably, there's no healing marks on this bone, so presumably that attack killed them. Again, no one archaeologist is <coughs> ever hopeful that this would come back as Viking period. <laughs> um, but obviously, somebody here met a grisly, grisly end, and their, their leg bone was basically hacked out with, with a sword. We've got a skull that had um, a hole in it, basically, but and it's a bone next to it called blunt force trauma. So basically somebody smashed this in the head up. Um, so there's, there's violence in some of these in these bones we're getting as well. Um, and again, I think that's more likely to be 10th, 11th century material than the early Christian material. And if it's that, you know, even if it's 9th century, it, it, uh, 10th century, it clicks then in with the, um, you know, the, the idea of these Viking marauders coming and attacking the monasteries. We'll see. We'll probably come back 20th century and we'll have to put your place. Um, so another thing that makes a uh, monastery are stone markers, great markers. So this is Mary Ann's trench and we have these, just as you start excavating down, so then we've got these little bits of stone sticking out, all kind of vaguely in line with each other. So Mary Ann excavated a little stock trench just to see, and lo and behold, there's a skull coming up. So yes, they were. It's burials on the other side of the, um, the sort of modern lands, and Mary also got the cemetery wall at the bottom of her trench. So, this is an extensive, big, big cemetery. Um, in the top sort above that, we've got a um, 11th century coin, I think. So, again, it shows 12th century coin. Thing. So, it shows you know, the, the cemetery went out of use probably in the sort of 11th century. So we've also, another thing that would be very indicative of a monastery is we've got fragments of star, um, cast stone crosses from um, this one. So this one actually matches up with the, star, the stone cross that's actually in the um, Heritage Centre Museum. This is just a fragment of it, so we found that. That was in uh, Mary Ann's trench, I think. Um, and that's an eccentric cross. <coughs> and then we've got this other one here, it's probably a bit later, so if you imagine you know, the high crosses on my own, so you've got a cross and stone, and then you've got open air holes, and then you've got a circle of stone. So this, this piece here, this edge, is actually like a, got some rope carving on it. So that would be one top edge of this circle of, a, of a, like a high cross. And then you've got some of the decoration. Obviously, as in probably as in I happened in Iona, it would happen here, you know, during the Reformation, a lot of these stone crosses just got smashed up and discarded. But we've got them at this one. So, we've got enclosure. We haven't got much enclosure at this one, must be said. The reason being, I think, is because the limestone ant crops so much that it would just be so, it would be such hard work, you'd have to hack through rock to make ditches and banks. So I think where they could make banks, they'd probably have, but elsewhere they'd probably have some kind of wooden enclosure, um, or even like, you know, a thorny hedge or something like that. But you can see here, this is um, built up of turf and possibly is the remains of, a, of an urban, urban bank. Right, so craft production. And I must mention here that the only person working is Mary Ann, who is <laughs> well supervised by Andy, and everybody else on looking, so good old Mary Ann. This, we got a lot. Every day, after about two hours, an hour, I don't know how long it took out and did to bail out every morning, but it took a long time. It's actually the most exciting bit, certainly for what I think of the whole of this one. This is where we've got the um, craft production, basically the waste craft production coming out here. As you can see, it's quite a peaty area, quite quite water log and wet. And it was quite a challenge to dig. This is it drained. So at this end, you can see you've got a stone structure coming around here, so I'm going to give you this one. So this is um, a plan of that trench, but again you have to flip the photograph in your brain. So that V-shaped entrance here is this entrance here, so this is stone wall, and it would come around in a big circle like that. So you can see it coming around, and it would come right around here. So this is basically, for all intents and purposes, a stone roundhouse. Um, you would imagine that it's probably therefore probably Iron Age in date. Um, 
However, you do get medieval round houses that we found some um, in, in um, Arden Work and once once with the forest. So you do actually get medieval round houses. And interestingly, medieval round houses are very much an Irish phenomenon, not a Scottish phenomenon. So again, we're on this one, there's this connection with Arden and things. So it could be a non age round house. I think it's much more likely to be related to the um, early Christian. Um, Monastery, so probably the 6th, 7th century in day. Um, the, the dark green is basically it's a stone flag floor. Um, it's got a sort of off centre post or another post or here. And what happened was this at one point the roof caught fire and collapsed in. But they also didn't abandon the, the roundhouse because then another floor level was built on top of that burning level. So we've got that one end, um, and I think it's probably contemporary with the other end of the trench, which is way down the bottom there, where we've got this metal um, working and the bottom. Basically craft, the waste of craft production and different kinds of craft. Um, so it was against this wall and in the peat, we've got quite a lot of material coming up and areas of burning and things coming up. And the other thing that we've got just off to one side, um, again Andy explained this in the first season, is an area of, clearly of cobble and paving, um, and the same sort of depth below the peat. So this would have been a yard associated probably with that craft working, craft production area. So if any other, uh, other work, we ever managed to get any more money, and more work happens in this, well this would be the area to concentrate on, because I think actually in terms of archaeological significance and finds, this is just the place where you're gonna, you're gonna get all the nice goodies, basically. So, out of that deposit, um, we got crucibles. So these basically would have, um, you'd have poured your mold and um, you would have melted your, your, your ore, possibly, um, I think most of these, I think Gemma's has done a little bit of analysis so far, it's just copper alloy at the moment, which is protected in these crucibles. But potentially you might get ones that have held silver and gold and things. So basically they would have been heated, um, and then a pair of tongs that held the, the little handle. And you get these at Danad. So, you know, Danad's king's seat in the early medieval period. Um, really significant site because it has metal working going on. And this more's got the same sort of material. We've actually got more crucibles from this more than they got from Danad. <laughs> this is a, these are our uh, mould fragments. So basically, Possibly in um, wax or sometimes um, bone or something, you would make um, your item you would make. So, say for example, a ring. So, you'd make a wax or, or, or a bone or even sometimes an antler, um, whatever object you felt that you wanted to you make into metal. You then press that material into clay and, and, and have the form, the shape of that um, object you want to make, say a ring. And then you'd have a flat top piece of top and clay. And basically then, so this would be sealed, you'd pour your metal into this um, little opening here, and it would fill, this is a ring for example, fill the void, um, the metal, you let it cool, and then you break it open, and then you'd have your ring that you could then refine and, and, and refile and refine. So this, these are, these are clay walls, that's why they're always broken, because you have to break them to get the work you're making out of them. We've got hundreds of bits of that and this from um, this one. Um, got bits of road, we've got rings, probably got lots of other things we haven't, we haven't done the analysis. At the moment, the National Museum are just doing um, an assessment to give us an idea of what we've got and how much it might cost to do sort of full-scale analysis. Another um, lovely little bit, this is a little bit of animal bone. If you look at it the other side, it just looks like a rubbish bit of animal bone. You can see this lovely S scroll. Now, Gemma thinks this was probably used to emboss leather. It was carved into, and it's tiny, tiny. Um, so, you know, we've got metal working, we've probably got um, working with leather. This is a lovely little piece here. So, this is animal bone. And you can see the amazing carving. I mean, these, these are tiny little bits of animal bone. And you can see the interlaced sort of carving that's done on it. This, this is the first time they've been found in, in Scotland. They're only really, really common in Ireland. In Ireland. And they're called motif pieces. And we've got two or three of those now from this one. So again, it's just 
a little insight into the way of life on this this monastic site. You know, they were producing really quite rich, um, um, exotic jewellery and items, probably religious items, and bow and chancels and all these kind of things. And they've got this amazing skills to, to carve this bone, um, which they have then used to probably press the clay to then make into metal. And then we've got, from the actual bandhouse itself, we've got this punch. Again, again, it's been used in metalworking, which is another reason why I think it's probably content with the metalworking now. So that's this one, which I think is an extraordinary site and just holds so much potential, really. So finally, we're going to move on to Leffen. So Leffen's on Mom. And, um, Again, a long history to this community dig. We excavated, first of all, at Ballasgate, um, which the Times Union looked at and thought was an um, early medical chapel. Um, oh, I've changed my mind now about Ballasgate. It's been published, but I don't know really what, what I said then. But anyway, that's based on what we found here. But at Ballasgate, we've got a 7th century cemetery under a building that we thought was probably a chapel. It didn't quite work that way. The chapel, or the building was um, 13th, 14th century, had a big enclosure around it, but none of the burials seemed to relate to that period. Um, and it did have this left, which is like an outsole, I had a altar, and a building and stuff. So we did conclude that it probably was a, probably an early monastic site and then later a chapel. But based on what we found left, I think that's probably not the case. So, this is very like by scale. This is um, an enclosure wall around a central large structure. This is a later bomb that's built over the walls. So we can just look at all that for now. Um, and this is us excavating the first time we're there, um, excavating the main, the main um, part of the main structure here. And then this is the enclosure wall. So just having a sort of general look at the site. So what do we get at uh, the left <coughs> Well, the only thing picture we've got is basically um, Norse period. So not the initial sort of incursions in the Vikings, but basically when these folk come and they'd settled and they were farming. So we've got this big hearth here um, and a post hole. Um, and you can see that we've got quite a lot of nice finds in there. So we've got um, a bone, an ant that comb and comb caves. We've got ant at the time, so we're doing basic craft working. Um, we've got a nice knife, um, we've got bolts of Johnny Bits of um, wood too, um, we've got some pottery, and we've got lots of cereal grain as well, so very productive. Oops, sorry, pressed the wrong button. And that's it in, as we did So that's actually the hearth, um, and this is the later enclosure wall of the medieval structure on top. So, <clears throat> very thermal, and we've Substance seems to sort of confirm that the Viking or the Norse stuff is there, but it's very fair, it's quite hard to spot. Um, but it is basically um, a Norse farmstead. So this is the um, code. <coughs> so this is the antler case. So you can see it's got beautiful little decorations on it. And then this is the extra code itself. Um, so a fantastic, fantastic find from from there. This is a um, basically like a whetstone, but again, the Norse had their own style of doing it, so this is a very typical shape and style of, of, of a homer compared to um, a non-Norse non non -Norse whetstone. Um, this feature here came back, had charcoal right at the base, it's a, um, a post hole, again, Norse period. So actually this, Last time we were here, we actually expected this trench further down to look for more evidence. Um, see, there's a Norse building there, got a couple more postals, but nothing very conclusive. It was quite frustrating. And then up here is a, a later um, metalworking area. So that's sort of late medieval. And this is the, when we were there last time. I mean, you can see this is basically a stone that's going diving down a big deep post hole. And there's a bit of a gully coming along here, and then there's a, in here there's a hearth. It's underneath a middle layer, we actually got over quite a lot of the site, and that middle layer lies <coughs> under 
the um, 13th, 14th century medieval farmstead. So therefore, this is very likely to be the Norse period. So it's probably, um, again, a bit like the, 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 the Neolithic house. This is probably a, a large post on here, and there would have been some kind of organic walling surrounding the Norse period house. And usually they're sort of elongated, sub-rectangular houses. So I think that's what we're getting um, at the left. And again, we have one Norse period um, structure, Ballascape. Again, up on the map, really, they're, they're as rare as rare. Um, they're not really found. But again, it's a, it's a nice first for our garden. <clears throat> this is actually um, a plan of the um, 12th, 13th century uh, medieval farmhouse. There's a stone, stone built with a turf, sort of like lower stone wall, and then you have turf on, um, above it. And you can see these post holes contemporary with that structure, but underneath the floor layer, we have these post holes here. Again, they're earlier, and they're probably again more in the end day. So you can see them here, this is us as we excavate them. So these are the ones contemporary with the actual structure, and then these are the earlier features. And this, this is the floor layer. So you can see here, you can see these ones, because they're contemporary with the structure. Whereas the Norse ones actually under all this middle floor, which is contemporary with this structure. So stratigraphically, we know that they're much earlier. Um, and I'm sort of skipping over the 12th, 14th century farmhouse, but again, medieval, spiral of medieval um, structures in our garden is very, very rare. Especially, you know, you, you get churches, remnants, bits of churches, but actual sort of everyday. Structure dating from that period, incredibly rare um, in Scotland, incredibly rare, and even rarer in Ireland. So, again, this is a really nice find, um, you know, and adds a huge amount of information um, to what these structures would have looked like and how they would have been used. And you can see these were, this was the really nice, in the <coughs> had um, stone orthostats that were laid, sort of end on, sort of like mini, little mini standing stones. That made the interior wall. See the little claps and down out of the way. And then it basically had a turf and stone level wall. Um, and then on top of that would have been um, probably a turf, just a turf wall, and then a, a roof on <coughs> top. And these timbers here would have supported the roof structure. And then probably in the 14th century, an enclosure would go around it. Obviously, the end bit of the wall, had the structure fallen down. So they replaced it with what we understand more conventionally as walling, you know, it's just coarse walling. So you can see the two different periods nicely together there. Oh, there you go. Prematurely, there's a slide that's illustrating that. So the enclosure wall thing, because of the way it's built, it's course start, is probably slightly later, 13th, 14th century in day, um, covering all the Norse stuff. So finally, in <coughs> the we have very, very strange burial. This is in the rubble, quite high up, stratigraphically. Um, and you can see the radio column date we got there. So, what drew us to, to Leffin in the first place was on the first edition map, it's labelled as a burial place. Um, so, everybody thought, oh, chapel. We've got no other evidence of being a chapel at all. So, from the, it's got a north farmstead, it's got a 12th, 13th, 14th century farmstead, it's definitely a farm. Farm buildings. The only burial we have is this one, which is basically almost modern. Um, and obviously, there was um, when the guys came around and did the maps for the first for the first edition maps, they spoke to lots of, lots of local people to get the local names to, to put on the maps. There was obviously some knowledge at that point of this burial being there, and so somebody said, "Well, it's the burial ground," but it's not consecrated ground. So we don't know. Who this person is, we can't find anything in the records in Rome. Um, yeah, this person had a mixed up, we did some um, um, analysis on his teeth. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. The date's a bit late. Um, apparently, um, some of the, the local um, trans chief, potentially somebody was brought back to the burial at Aros, which is the, the castle site. Um, but it doesn't really fit with the date we've got here. So we don't know who this person is, so it's one of, one of the mysteries. But we only literally took just a sample of two from we left. Um, that's the part of the skull, so the rest of the body is actually in the board, we never excavated. So we just 
covered it up and, and buried it so they're still still in place. So that's the double talk. And um, yes, if you, if you feel inspired, keep an eye on the Facebook page and you can you too can get that money. <laughs> Are you happy to have questions? Yeah, sure. If you can repeat the question and then people can hear it. <coughs> Anybody got questions? Is there any particular reason why you were doing a bit of finesse? It looks like it's quite near for the milk. Yeah, the finesse side was a commercial job, so basically um, there's a new house. Well, there's, a, there's a farmstead that already built, built there. And obviously, folk bought the plot and they wanted to build a brand new house. And because um, kids and things have been found in the local area, what happened was that the planners got an artificial device, it's called Voicesat, and they put a condition on the plan that you have to do it with any archaeology. So that's why I was at Vanessa.
there's a, again, a, an advanced commercial um, development, there's a new house plot. We found a little irony site that's unenclosed, again, very rare, but it's not been that much digging in Alan Bar, so all these sites seem to be a first world girl, but I think it's just because nobody's really dug much. And in there there's a little hearth, and from that we've got a little toggle bead about that size, and it's, it's made out of glass, and it's about 3,000, I'm sorry, 300 BC. The glass has basically been brought in one way or another, probably trade or trade or trade. Um, and these little toggles you get, so it's like, you know, the little bell shaped, not bell shaped, what sort of word? Um, dumbbell shaped toggles, that's a word, and they're only about that size. And you only really get them in glass in Argyle and Ireland. So again, it's showing that link for that period between. You can imagine it, you know, communication by sea, Argyle and Ireland were actually closer than the rest of Scotland, really, you know, so <clears throat> they were much more on us. So it's a very, it's very limited. You get a couple elsewhere, but really, that, that's where the concentration is. Um, so you get in specific design that is just made of glass, brought all the way up, and somebody sitting around a domestic hearth in Argyle making this little toggle beach from glass bought from the Mediterranean. And presumably they were making it for whoever was the elite at the time, but they were using the fire for the domestic site. Maybe they were staying there, peddling their wares to the, to the higher echelons of society. And again, it's, what it really is, Archaeology for me is about that little connection to people. And you can sit there and you can put this out and you think, oh my goodness me, somebody's not seen this since 300 BC. And they make this tiny little um, toggle bead. And I got involved with a woman um, from the British Museum and we did all this analysis. And actually, the paper's going to be published next year. It's got, she's done videos of it. It's fantastic. It's just amazing. You know, from a tiny little toggle, you can create this whole story and, and um, you know, done all the scientific analysis on it and it's created a whole Fantastic story. So that's the sort of thing. Cool. Has there been any recent archaeological work done in Glen Lonan? Sorry, Ben? In Glen Lonan. Glen Lonan? Yeah. Not, not I'm aware. Mm. I'm not aware of any. It could be. I mean, there are other people working in Argyle. So, you know, there's a lot of the um, central government units do come in and, and are working in Argyle as well. So. Sorry, somebody. Um, do you ever see a time when uh, there's going to be a light or a bit on Mars? On Mars? I don't know anything. Uh, uh, one would hope so because I think, yes, it would be amazing. Um, Mary Braithwaite on Ling, she organised um, managed to get funding to get a lighter survey done on Ling, and I think they found over 400 sites with that and doing walkover survey. Um, so, yeah, fantastic um, stuff. Um, but, yeah, don't actually. It's down to Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission. Budgets. Sorry? Budgets. Budgets, yes. At the moment, like, everybody's suffering, um, and archaeology as well. I mean, we're not having any um, community excavation this year because you just can't get the money at the moment. Um, but, yeah, I mean, hopefully. It seems to be, if you get flooding, Seeker seems to pay for live survey, so don't wish flooding on anybody, but um, <laughs> yes, if you get flooding, you can see live on surveys, which then we can use the data, which is quite good, but obviously it's not a great way of getting the survey now. Okay, we've got another question. Yes, Sarah. Um, I'm interested in the Scottish Archaeological Society and the Thank you.